the only constant in life is change. But change means uncertainty, and uncertainty can be scary. Hi, I'm Edward, and dealing with change is literally my job description. But at some point in our lives, we all have been confronted with a major change. 13 years ago, I left Austria, hence the accent, and that was quite a change for me. I left behind the familiar, the known, the comfortable, and I would be lying if I'd say I wasn't at least a little bit scared. My way of dealing with it was finding something small in my new life that felt familiar. So I joined a basketball team. It was an environment where I understood the rules and had something in common with the people around me. When I stepped on that court, life felt normal. So how can we apply the same thinking to dealing with change in technology and the change in society that often comes with it? How can we become more comfortable with the unfamiliar? We're now well and truly in the age of AI, and if, if, if that makes some of you uncomfortable, you're not alone. In a few years, AI will be as ubiquitous as electricity, powering nearly everything without us even noticing. And if you look at electricity as a technology, it's about AC and DC and transformers and network grids. But its impact has been giving us everything from light at night to the internet to space travel, and with that has fundamentally changed how we live our lives. So what is AI? Here's one definition. A machine's ability to keep improving its performance without humans having to explain exactly how to accomplish all the tasks it's given. Whew. This sounds a bit complicated, so let's break this down. Number one, software gets better over time without any updates to it. And number two, we don't have to code every single rule to make it do its job. And I would like to emphasize the exactly in this statement here. Artificial intelligence does not mean that machines learn completely independently. Just like children do not learn without any input of the ones around us. My kids are five years old now. They soak up information like a sponge, and I get a first-hand experience about how they learn the softer skills in life, like humor, for example. My son will say or do things that he thinks is funny, and then he will gauge my reaction to see if it actually was funny. So my feedback typically ranges from, yeah, that's hilarious, all the way to, huh, I quite, don't quite get it. Um, all the way to, oh my god, please don't ever say this in public. <laughs> I know, apparently I'm not alone. So over time, he will use this feedback to improve his humor. The key here is that I don't have to explain exactly why something is or isn't funny. I just give him feedback, yes or no. One piece of feedback is statistically irrelevant, and so he tries it again and again and again, and sometimes it feels like it never stops. But in his own way, he's generating data and feedback. Feedback defines patterns, and that's essentially what AI is wrong direction, clearly. Sorry about that. That's essentially what AI is. Pattern detection in a vast data set. Think of Netflix. I open Netflix, and it will recommend a show to me that it thinks I may like, based on what I watched previously, and what is popular with other people like me. In technical terms, this is about classification, who are people like me, and prediction. What else could I like? The feedback is me watching it or not. A more complex example is using pattern detection to develop cognitive skills, seeing, listening, and reading. In other words, the ability to make sense of speech, images, and text. Take a moment and look at the pictures up here on the wall. OK. Raise your hands if you had to take a second look to figure out exactly what you're looking at. Yeah? 
How did you decide if this is a puppy or a muffin? How would you describe this to the person sitting next to you? Puppies have eyes, okay. But those dark circles, they're so similar. They could be eyes, or a nose, or even a chocolate chip. It's hard enough to explain this in everyday language. It's impossible to code this into rules for software. Yet the accuracy of computer vision software has increased from 70 to 96%. 96%? That's better than most humans do. And now, replace the images of puppies and muffins with cancer screenings, for example, and you can see the significance. Personal recommendations are everywhere. Google, Facebook, Microsoft, they're all tagging you automatically in photos. Fake news generated by bots are swaying public opinion. We have self-driving vehicles in Christchurch, by the way. AI isn't coming. It's here. The only constant in life is change, and change always opens up new opportunities. But it can also pose a threat to the existing. It is how we deal with change that will define if we succeed or get left behind. And look, you know, we all like to think it's not going to happen to us. Blockbuster thought the same thing, and we all know how that went. Kodak, Nokia, Blackberry, all examples of really big companies who are now almost relegated to the history books because they didn't keep up with the change in demand. The experience that people started to expect. The seamless and complete integration of technology in people's everyday lives. You can choose to stay with the familiar and comfortable, but the world around you won't stand still. Whether you're ready for it or not, this is the new world we live in. So, let's imagine this new world together. This world is exciting. The sky is the limit. What I love most about AI is its potential to free us from the mundane and boring. And let's admit it. We all have tasks, repetitive tasks, time-consuming tasks in our jobs that we'd love to get rid of. When I think of AI, I think less about artificial intelligence and more about assisted intelligence. Let me show you what I mean. Mercury is not going to like me now. Raise your hands if you hate the idea of calling your power provider or internet provider. I know, right? Who wants to be on hold for 20 minutes just to update their contact details? Call centers get bogged down with password resets, change of contact details, and other trivial account inquiries. AI can now easily identify what you want in a chat, email, or even a phone call and respond instantly. And as a result, call centers can spend more time helping you with your non-trivial problems. Shifting gears, our kids' education. <laughs> we recently worked with a major university on identifying students who are at risk of dropping out. Being able to proactively reach out to these students and helping at least some of them finish their studies has a direct financial benefit to the university, and at the same time, it makes a big difference to each of these students. And on a national scale, it leads to a better educated workforce. And in health, where we've seen significant uptake of AI already, we can now process cancer screenings and assign a risk factor. This allows highly trained radiologists to focus their attention on the likely positives. To put this in context, a radiologist told me that she routinely goes through 400 mammograms in a four-hour period on a Friday afternoon. 400! That's 30 seconds per image if she doesn't take a break. I know that I wouldn't want my wife's mammogram to be number 323 on that list. There's just no way anybody can keep this up without eventually making a mistake. All of these projects I find personally rewarding. 
Yes, they're all commercially beneficial to our clients, but they also make life better for a whole lot of people, and that's what I get excited about. Yet, they're still just applications of technology. We're also starting to see a major shift in our behavior as digital interactions move more towards conversations. Think about it. For thousands of years, humanity has conducted business through conversations. When computers came around, they weren't smart enough, not cognitive enough, to understand us. So for almost 40 years, we put up with windows and icons and keyboards. But now we can go back to our innate desire for conversations and simply say what we want. As an industry, we've spent considerable effort on making our apps, uh, apps and websites easier to use. But the rules are changing. Our goal now increasingly has to be to seamlessly intertwine our services with people's everyday lives. As a customer, I will demand the convenience of messaging you, send me my usual pizza, or simply saying, Alexa, send my wife her favorite flowers on her, on her anniversary, on our anniversary. <laughs> Can you kill that? Thank you. Um, and not long after that, Alexa will proactively offer me to send her flowers when the time comes. This is the experience that people are after now. This is really exciting stuff. But I bet right about now, at least some of you are thinking about your whale project. You know, that big hairy project that sucks up all your budget and energy. How could you possibly fit in something else? But here's the beautiful thing. It doesn't have to be big and it doesn't have to be complex. In my experience, getting into AI is actually surprisingly easy. Starting small, you can go with assisted decision making. I'll spare you the technical details, but on a high level, we develop something we call a model. In a nutshell, we go through the steps of analyzing what data is available, visualizing it to see correlations and develop hypotheses, applying algorithms, and exposing it to applications, for example, as a web service. I hear you asking, how long does it take? A year? Six months? Three months? Actually, it only takes two to three weeks. It obviously varies case by case, but mostly my teams can stick to our goal of under three weeks. Here's the catch, though. The accuracy of these models in such a short time frame isn't high enough to be considered a finished product. It is, however, high enough to show off the potential of solving the problem. And it is high enough to use it for assisted decision making, which in simple terms just means making suggestions. If you think back to our example around the students at risk, AI is identifying likely dropout candidates but it is still a department head who ultimately decides on the intervention. So what have we got for a three-week investment here? We tested the concept very fast because we limited risk. It's still a human making the final decision. We improved the service immediately. We now know which uh, students to reach out to. And we took a page out of my son's playbook and we built in a feedback mechanism. Does the uh, university act on our suggestion or not? Remember, AI is a machine's ability to keep improving its, its performance. And that's exactly what happens here. We don't have to explain if it, why a suggestion was right or wrong. We simply correct or confirm and gather more data. Another easy way to get started, chatbots. Think back to the call center example, and, and Roxanne just mentioned this before. Imagine if you could reduce the frustration by having a chatbot respond to first calls instantly. Commercially, chatbots are a no-brainer, and when done well, they're great. Yet more often than not, 
the shift of frustration around waiting time to a frustration around the experience. This is because most organizations focus on the technology. This is not about technology. This is about the experience. Much like my son needs practice refining his humor, a chatbot needs practice, but your customers aren't the one that should suffer. My son gets to practice with me in a safe environment. Do the same with your chatbots. Have them read incoming requests or listen in on phone calls and simply suggest a response to your staff initially. Again, you test the concept very fast, you limit risk, it's still a human responding. You immediately improve service because you speed up response times. And you build in a feedback mechanism does the call center accept your suggestion or not? And it will train your bot for prime time. None of what I just said should take a huge amount of time or cost you an arm on the leg. Yes, there's quite a bit of complexity under the hood, but going back to the electricity analogy, we don't have to understand AC and DC and transformers and network grids. All we have to do is all we have to know is how to flip a switch. Electricity has changed the world as we knew it. Data, and more importantly, how we use it, is next. So I encourage you to think of AI not so much as a technology, but as a journey and an experience. So how do we begin? Start with something familiar. Start small, but dream big. <laughs> Throw the rules out the window, try something new. Get comfortable again. Surround yourself with a great team. Get inspired. Talk to us. Tell us what you're thinking about. But whatever you do, don't get left behind. Now, I just caught up on time quite well. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Just giving you a whole bunch of information. I'm going to go out on a limb and say some of this might be, uh, take a little bit of time to process. So what I thought is you could take about 30 seconds and just process it and have a chat to the people around you about what you're thinking about. Who can you talk to about this? Where can you apply this in your business? What's a small thing that you can start doing today? <laughs> 